Hello, this is Serene from Exam Help Lab. Today I'll be solving Physics Paper 2 ES Level Structured Questions 9702 Paper 2 Radiant 2 May June 2020. Question number 1, Part A, define velocity. So velocity is rate of change of displacement. So we can write that change of displacement. Since velocity is a vector quantity, so we must take Displacement in, into account rather than distance divided by time taken. Part B, the drag force FD acting on a car moving with speed V along a straight horizontal road is given by force is equals to speed square into area into a constant where K is a constant and A is the cross-sectional area of the car. Determine the SI base units of K. So K is equals to force divided by speed square into area where force is equal to kilograms meters per second square speed square is equal to meter square per second square and area is equal to meter square so this becomes kilograms meters per second square divided by meter to the power 4 per second square so the SI base units for K constant is kilogram per meter cube. Part C, the value of K in SI base units for the car in part B is 0.24. The cross-sectional area A of the car is 5.1 meters square. The car is traveling with a constant speed along a straight road and the output power of the engine is 4.8 to 10 to the power of 4 watts. Assume that the output power of the engine is equal to the rate at which the drag force is doing work against the car. So mind the speed of the car. So the car is traveling with a constant speed, uh, meaning that uh, there is no resultant force acting on this car. The driving force of the car is going to be equal to the drag force FD. The formula for power of engine is equal to force by car's engine into speed of car. Since force by car's engine is equal to drag force, we can equate that power is equal to resistive force or the drag force acting against the motion of the car, which is FD into speed, where FD is equal to K into V square into A. And so 4.8 into 10 to the power of 4 is equal to K has a value of 0.24 while A has a value of 5.1. So that gives us 1.224 VQ. And so the speed of the car is 34 meters per second. Question number 2, part A. Figure 2.1 shows the velocity time graph for an object moving in a straight line. Part 1, determine an expression in terms of u, v, and t for the area under the graph. So area under the graph of velocity versus time graph is displacement. That object is traveling in t seconds. So area is of trapezium. This is a, uh, this is a shape of a trapezium. So area of trapezium is equal to half into height into sum of parallel sides. These two sides they are parallel to each other while this one is considered height. So half into height is of t seconds into sum of parallel sides so it's u plus v so the area in terms of u v and t is u plus v the whole multiplied by t divided by 2. part 2 state the name of the quantity represented by the area under the graph so that's displacement Part B, a ball is kicked with a velocity of 15 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees to horizontal ground. The ball then strikes a vertical wall at the instant when the path of the ball becomes horizontal, as shown in figure 2.2. Assume that air resistance is negligible. Part 1, by considering the vertical motion of the ball, calculate the time it takes to reach the wall. So it is said that the ball hits the wall as soon as it takes its horizontal path, which means that it has already covered the height it could possibly cover before coming down onto the ground or before hitting the vertical wall. So for a vertical component of the ball, we can consider that its initial velocity will be, since this is traveling in a projectile motion where it has got a vertical component as well as horizontal component, so its vertical component will be 
15 sine 60 because this is the side we want this is what is given to us and this angle is given to us so the vertical initial vertical component of the ball is 15 sine 60 acceleration is negative 9.81 since it is traveling uh, against the ground final velocity when it reaches its maximum height is going to be zero and we are asked to find time taken for this change in velocity so we can use our formula acceleration is equals to final velocity minus initial velocity divided by time taken since acceleration is 9.81 is equals to zero minus 15 sine 60 divided by time and so we get the time interval for this as 1.32 seconds but to explain why the horizontal component of the velocity of the ball remains constant as it moves to the wall so there is no change in velocity the velocity is staying constant for whole its horizontal component of uh, the motion which also means that there is no acceleration acting on the ball while it is covering horizontal distance so the final answer would be that there is no force acting on the ball in horizontal direction there, there is no acceleration because acceleration is that one thing that causes change in velocity and when there is no change in velocity means there is no acceleration in short there is no force acting on the ball in this path. Part 3 showed that the ball strikes the wall with a horizontal velocity of 7.5 meters per second. Okay, so since the horizontal part remains constant, so we need not worry about the speed uh, with which this ball strikes the vertical ball. It will be exactly the same as it is over here. So this is going to be 15 cos 60 since we are given with this side and not the adjacent, and we are given with the angle 2. So 15 cos 60 is the horizontal velocity and that is equal to 7.5 meters per second. Part C, the mass of the ball in part B is 0.4 kilograms. It is in contact with the wall for a time of 0.12 seconds and rebounds horizontally with a speed of 4.3 meters per second. Part 1, use the information from B part 3 to calculate the change in momentum of the ball due to the collision. So change in momentum is equal to mass into final velocity minus initial velocity. So the initial velocity with which this ball uh, makes the contact with uh, this wall is going to be 7.5 and the final velocity it leaves uh, after it makes the contact with the wall is 4.3. But since momentum is a vector quantity, so we must take negative and positive signs into consideration. Over here, it reaches with 7.5 meters per second and it changes its direction to 4.3. So it's 4.3 meters per second will have a sign of negative and 7.5 will be positive since these two directions are opposite to each other. So mass of ball is 0.4. Final speed was 4. Point, minus 4.3 minus initial velocity, which was 7.5. And you get a change in momentum of 4.72. Part 2 calculate the magnitude of the average force exerted on the ball uh, by the wall. So, um, force is equal to change in momentum, which is 4.72. And this change was caused in the time interval of 0.12 seconds. So, the average force uh, exerted on the ball is of 39.3 Newton's magnitude. Question number three, part A, explain what is meant by work done. So work done is equal to force multiplied by displacement. And displacement needs to be in direction of that force. Part B, a ball of mass 0.42 kilograms is dropped from the top of a building. The ball falls from rest through a vertical distance of 78 meters to the ground. So it is initially at rest, it travels a distance of 78 meters and it has an acceleration off, which we'll talk about later. 
So air resistance is significant, which means we won't be taking acceleration as 9.8 once since air resistance is in action, so that the ball reaches a constant velocity before hitting the ground. The ball hits the ground with a speed of 23 meters per second. So a terminal velocity means a constant velocity, so the final velocity it had was of 23 meters per second, and then it hits the ground after it reaches the speed of 23 meters per second. So part, for, uh, part 1 calculate for the ball falling from the top of the building to the ground, the decrease in gravitational potential energy. So decrease in gravitational potential energy is equal to mass into g 9.81 into height it covers which is of 78 meters and then you get the loss of uh, loss in gravitational potential energy as 321.4 joules. The increase in kinetic energy so half into mass of the ball is 0.42 into change in velocity means uh, velocity when it was at the top of the building and when it was uh, on the ground so it was 23 minus 0 the whole square and you get an increase in kinetic energy as 111.1 joules but to use your answers in b part 1 to determine the average resistive force acting on the ball as it falls from the top of the building to the ground. So at the highest point at the top of the building, this ball had a gravitational potential energy of um, 321.4 joules. And uh, when it reaches ground level, it had a kinetic energy of uh, 111.1 joules. And according to law of conservation of energy, uh, no energy is lost, which means that uh, this total gravitational potential energy will be equal to this total kinetic energy plus heat energy as uh, in the beginning it is said that um, air resistance is significant means it cannot be ignored. So we can write that the total gravitational potential energy which is of 321.4 joules is equal to total kinetic energy which is 111.1 plus thermal energy. which is due to uh, air resistance, so thermal energy will be equal to two hundred and ten point three joules and energy is equal to force into distance so resistive force will be equal to energy due to uh, energy in the form of heat which is two hundred and ten point three divided by the distance it covers is of 78 meters and you get an average resistive force of 2.7 newtons. Part C, the ball in part B is dropped at time t is equals to zero and hits the ground at time t is equals to uh, t. The acceleration of the free fall is g. Uh, on figure 3.1 sketch a line to show the variation of the acceleration a of the ball with time t from time t is equals to zero to time t is equals to t. Okay, so uh, before reaching terminal velocity, the ball's weight was greater than the resistive force acting on it, meaning that it was at first moving with um, increasing acceleration due to um, gravitational force, g, and then it starts to move with constant acceleration, and then it starts to move with decreasing acceleration before it reaches terminal velocity. A velocity versus time graph for, that, for this situation where the ball has reached a terminal velocity would be somewhat like this where this portion of the graph is actually of increasing acceleration uh, this portion of the graph is constant acceleration while this one over here is the decreasing acceleration and here uh, the velocity velocity gets constant means the ball has reached its terminal velocity so from this you can see that from increasing uh, acceleration to constant acceleration to decreasing acceleration so basically acceleration is decreasing but not at a constant rate uh, at time t is equals to zero, it's right on top of the building and starts to fall down with only g acting on it. So at time t is equals to zero, there is only this g acting on the ball. Then there is a slight resistive force starts to act on it uh, before it touches. Um, so there is going to be a curve right from here not a straight line but a curve uh, because you have seen over here that change in acceleration over here is not constant in the uh, initially it was increasing acceleration then constant and then decreasing 
a few uh, seconds before it touches ground ball had terminal velocity meaning that uh, zero acceleration before t but not at t because time this t the ball touches the ground and it is said in the beginning that um, a few moments before it touches the ground it already has reached um, the terminal velocity so i'll consider this point and i will have a curve Question number four, part A. State the difference between progressive waves and stationary waves in terms of the transfer of energy along the wave. So progressive waves transfer energy. So that's something very theoretical. Um, you need to learn the differences between these two waves uh, while a stationary waves, they do not transfer energy. Part B, a progressive wave travels from left to right along a stretched for string. Figure 4.1 shows part of the string at one instant. P, Q and R are three different points on the string. The distance between P and R is 0.48 meters. The wave has, uh, the wave has a period of 0 0.02 seconds. Part 1, use figure 4.1 to determine the wavelength of the wave. So um, a wavelength is from this one trough. to the other trough this is one complete wavelength so this is one wavelength of a complete wave and distance from one trough to one crest is half of wavelength so i can consider that 0.48 meters has covered a um, three by two of wavelength means one complete wavelength and half of that wavelength so i can divide 0.48 by 3 which is 0.16 meters meaning that from one crest to one trough mm -hmm. there's going to be 0.16 meters so from one crest to the other crest it will be 0.16 into 2 which is 0.32 meters part 2 calculate the speed of the wave so a speed has a formula of um, wavelength into frequency where um, frequency is equals to 1 by time period so speed is equals to wavelength is of 0.3 meters uh, divided by time period is of 0 0.02 seconds and then we get the speed as 16 meters per second part 3 determine the phase difference between point, points q and r so the phase difference between uh, points q and r is going to be calculated by dividing distance between q and r uh, by wavelength into 360 degrees. So distance between Q and R is going to be that. Q to this Q is half of wavelength, which is 0.16 meters. And then this again is 0.16 meters. And from here until point R is going to be 0.16 divided by 2. So this in total would make up 0.4 meters. So distance between Q and R is 0.4 divided by the wavelength of the that, of that wave, which is 0.32 multiplied by 360 degrees, and you get a phase difference of 450 degrees. Part 4, figure 4.1 shows the position of the string at time t is equals to 0. Describe how the displacement of one Q on the string varies with time t is equals to 0 to time t is equals to 0 0.01 seconds. At time t is equals to 0, it, it starts to have this wave pattern until it comes right here. And it is said that the time period of a wave is 0 0.020 seconds. So this time interval will be of 0 0.020 seconds, meaning this time interval will be of 0 0.01 second. So we can write that at time t is equals to 0. From time t is equals to 0 until half of 0 0.01 seconds which is t is equals to 0 0.005 seconds from time t is equals to 0 to time t is equals to 0 0.005 seconds q starts to move with a maximum downward displacement this is the displacement it covers and then it comes back to its original position at time t is equals to 0 0.01 seconds so Q travels its maximum mm, 
downwards displacement at t is equal to 0.005 seconds and comes back to its original position where amplitude is zero at t is equal to 0 0.01 seconds. Part C, a stationary wave is formed on a different string that is stretched between two fixed points x and y. Figure 4.2 shows the position of the string when each point is at its maximum displacement. Part 1 explains what is meant by a node of a stationary wave. So here is the node on this wave. So it's a point where amplitude is zero. So a node has a zero amplitude. Part 2 state the number of antinodes of the wave shown in figure 4.2. Uh, antinodes are all those points where amplitude is maximum. So this is the antinode and this is the antinode. So there are two antinodes in this string. Part 3 state the phase difference between points W and Z on the string. So the phase difference between two points on a stationary wave is uh, the number of nodes between those two points multiplied by 180 degrees. As there is just one node between W and Z, so the phase difference over here between W and Z is of 180 degrees. Part 4. A new stationary wave is now formed on the string. The new wave has a frequency that is half of the frequency of the wave shown in figure 4.2. Half of the frequency means that now this wave has got double the wavelength. The speed of the wave is unchanged. On figure 4.3, draw, draw a position of the string for this new wave when each point is at its maximum displacement. So now when the wavelength has increased in the previous diagram, it was a one complete wave, while over here we'll have half of, half of the wavelength. where I'll have my anti-node right in the middle of x and y and two nodes right here. Question number five, one end of a wire is attached to a fixed point, a force F is applied to the wire to cause extension X. The variation with F of X is shown um, in figure 5.1. The wire has a cross-sectional area of 4.1 into 10 to the power of negative 7 meters square and is made of a metal of young modulus 1.7 into 10 to the power of 11 pascals. Assume that the cross-sectional area of the wire remains constant as the wire extends. Part A. State the name of the law that describes the relationship between F and X shown in figure 5.1. So the graph shows a straight line through origin means force is directly proportional to extension and that is Hooke's law. Part B, the wire has an extension of 0.48 millimeters. Determine part 1, the stress. So stress has a formula of force divided by area. At an extension of 0.48 millimeters, which is over here, we had the force exerted on the spring as 36 newtons. So the force is of 36 newton magnitude and the cross-sectional area of the wire is 4.1 into 10 to the power of negative 7 and we get a stress of 8.8 .8 into 10 to the power of 7 pascals. Part 2, the strain. Since we do not have the original length of the wire, we can use the formula Young modulus is equal to stress over strain, where strain is stress over Young modulus. And so it will be 8.8 .8 into 10 to the power of 7 and Young modulus is 1.7 into 10 to the power of 11 and we get a strain of 5.2 into 10 to the power of negative 4 and it has got no units. The resistivity of the metal of the wire is 3.7 into 10 to the power of negative 7 ohm meter. To determine the change in resistance of the wire when the extension of the wire changes from uh, 0.48 millimeters to uh, 0.6 millimeters. So resistance is equal to resistivity into um, length, which is the new length divided by cross-sectional area, at an extension of 0.48 millimeters. 
the resistance was 3.7 into 10 to the power of negative 7 into the new length when the extension was of 0.48 millimeters combines original length and the extension. The original length can be calculated from our value strain. So strain was of 5.2 into 10 to the power of negative 4. And it has a formula of uh, extension over original length. Our extension is of 0.48 meters. Let's convert that to meters divided by 1000 and then the original length. So our original length is 12 by 13 meters. Now over here I can write that 12 by 13 plus 0.48 millimeters. That is 0.9236 meters divided by cross-sectional area which is 4.1 into 10 to the power of negative 7. The resistance of the wire when the extension um, caused by the force on the wire is of 0.48 millimeters is of 0.8 three three five ohms now resistance when the extension caused um, on the wire is 0.6 millimeters is going to be 3.7 into 10 to the power of negative 7 into the new length again is the um, is the combination of original length plus the extension 0.6 millimeters so the new length is going to be 12 by 13 which is the original length plus the extension of the wire a 0.6 millimeters that gives me uh, a newer length of 0.9237 meters divided by cross-sectional area of the wire which is 4.1 into 10 to the power of negative 7 and we get a newer resistance of 0.83356 ohms and the change in resistance is the difference in these um, resistances and we get the change as 1.083 into 10 to the power of negative 4 ohms but the force of greater than 45 newtons is now applied to the wire. Describe how it may be checked that the elastic limit of the wire has not been exceeded. So we can remove the force. And check if a wire gets back to its original position. Because uh, if it has exceeded the uh, elastic limit, it would uh, deform and wouldn't come back to its original position. Question number six, part A. A battery of electromotive force of um, 7.8 volts and internal resistance R is connected to a filament lamp as shown in figure 6.1. A total charge of 750 coulombs moves through the battery in a time interval of 1500 seconds. During this time, the filament lamp dissipates 5.7 kilojoules of energy. The EMF of the battery remains constant. Part 1 explain in terms of energy and without a calculation why the potential difference across the lamp must be less than the EMF of the battery. So, this is due to energy dissipation in the um, battery's internal resistance so we can write that there is energy dissipated due to battery's internal resistance so there are lost volts all because of battery's internal resistance Otherwise, EMF uh, would have been equal to PD across the component, which is lamp in this case. But to calculate the current in the circuit, current is equal to charge divided by time. Charge passing through the circuit is 750 coulombs divided by time. Time it takes is 5, 1500 and you get a current of 0.5 amperes. The potential difference across the lamp, so potential difference is equal to the energy dissipated by the lamp divided by current across it multiplied by the time takes by the current to flow. Energy dissipation is 5.7 into 1000 since 5.7 was in kilojoules divided by the current passes through the lamp is 0.5 and the time it takes uh, for that current to pass is 1500 and you get a potential difference of 7.6 volts. The internal resistance of the battery since it is said over here that uh, the potential difference will not be equal to EMF which means that, and you can see that the EMF was of 7.8 volts while the potential difference is of 7.6 volts, 7.6 volts. This means that uh, the loss volts were 7.8 minus 7.6, which is of 0.2 volts. This is the amount of the volts lost due to internal resistance. 
So internal resistance is equal to voltage divided by current, the loss volts for 0.2, and the current passing across uh, the internal resistor is 0.5, and you get an internal resistance of 0.4 ohms. Part B, a student is provided with three resistors of resistances 90 ohms, 45 ohms, and 20 ohms. Part 1, sketch a circuit diagram showing how two of these three resistors may be connected together to give a combined resistance of 30 ohms between the terminals shown. Since the combined resistance is uh, much lower than any of these three resistors, this means that the two resistors which will be connected will be uh, in parallel with each other. So uh, I suppose that 90 and 45 can, um, if they are connected in parallel with each other, can give a combined resistance of 30 ohms. Suppose this is of 90 ohms and this is of 45 ohms. So 90 into 45 divided by 90 plus 45. That can give you a combined resistance of 30 ohms. Part 2. A potential divider circuit is produced by connecting the three resistors to a battery of EMF uh, 9 volts in, and negligible internal resistance. The potential divider circuit provides an output potential difference of 3.6 volts. The circuit diagram is shown in figure 6.2. Um, on figure 6.2, label the resistances of all three resistors and the potential difference V out. So the potential difference V out is of um, 3.6 volts. Now uh, there are three resistors available to us, 90 ohms, 45 ohms, and 20 ohms. You have to arrange them accordingly so that you get a V out of 3.6 volts. Now that is not clear whether 3.6 volts is uh, the voltage across this component or the voltage across uh, this combination of uh, parallel resistors. Now what if uh, um, this resistor is of 90 ohms and this is of 45 ohms and this is of 20 ohms. Uh, do any of the V outs here or here is of 3.6 volts. Let's calculate voltage across this 90 ohms. So V out is equals to uh, the resistance of this resistor which is 90 ohms into the EMF of the battery which is 9 divided by the sum of the resistors over here in series so 90 plus the combined resistance of 45 and 20 is 13.846 and now the voltage across 90 ohms is equal to 7.8 volts now this across this resistor is 7.8 across this then will be 1.2 volts, which uh, doesn't give uh, a V out of 3.6 volts. So this case is not possible. Now, what if uh, this resistor is of 45 ohms of resistance and in parallel are 90 ohms and um, 20 ohms? Now, the V out across or the voltage across 45 ohms will be 45 ohms into the EMF of the battery divided by 45 plus the combined resistance of 90 into 20 which is 16.36 ohms and you get a V out of 6.6 volts which again won't give 3.6 volts in either um, of these uh, V outs. So again this is not possible. Now what if I place um, 20 ohms of resistor over here and 90 ohms over here and 45 ohms in parallel with 90 ohms. So V out across 20 ohms will be 20 ohms into EMF of battery divided by 20 plus the combined resistance of 90 and 45 which is 30. So you get a V out of 3.6 volts. This means that this is the true case where 20 ohms is in series with a parallel connection of 90 and 45 ohms and this will be your V out as 3.6 volts. Question number 7, part A, a nucleus of an element X decays by emitting a beta plus particle to produce a nucleus of potassium-39 and a neutrino. The decay is represented by the following equation. Part 1, state the number represented by each of the following letters. So beta plus um, has zero mass. So P is equals to zero. And um, Q is um, sum of all the mass numbers on the right, means 39 plus zero plus zero. Thus, Q will have a value of 39. R is the charge on beta plus particle, which is of plus 1. And uh, S is the sum of all the charges over here. So like 19 plus 1 plus 0, which is 20. 
but to state the name of the interaction force that gives rise to a beta plus decay so that's weak nuclear force part b a hedron is composed of three identical quarks and it has a charge of plus two where E is the elementary charge, determine a possible type of the quark, explain your working. So it consists of three identical quarks. So suppose uh, each quark has a charge of X and has a combined charge of plus 2E. This means that each quark will carry a charge of positive 2 by 3E. And that's the up quark with positive 2 by 3E charge. So there were three up quarks. that made up this hedron. So we're done with this paper. Thank you for watching.